Hello, everybody, and welcome. As you're coming in, getting your audio connected, we're excited to have everybody. Yeah, here goes. <laughs> if you're not already muted, uh, go ahead and mute yourself just so that there's less background noise. All right, and we'll go ahead and get started. We'll probably have a few more people rolling in here. Um, so first of all, um, one of the things that I did not ask you when you uh, signed up for this session was what your discipline or disciplinary background was. Um, and so I'll go ahead and launch the poll, just getting a sense of where are people at in terms of what program you're in or what area of healthcare you work in. So if you don't mind, you can work on that question while I do a brief introduction. Um, so um, welcome to this panel presentation on medical social work. Um, we're coming to you uh, during the month of March, which is National Social Work Month, uh, which happens every year in March. And this year's theme is empowering social workers. And so um, we're hoping that in this month, um, social workers will take this theme to heart and others will as well to recognize the life affirming work that social workers do. Uh, social workers are in high demand. And if you want to learn how social workers make an impact on the quality of care provided in healthcare settings, you've come to the right place. So if this panel inspires you to pursue a social work degree at the bachelor's, master's, or PhD level, we will have contact information at the end of the session for you to explore that further. So um, looks like our uh, background information is getting filled out. We've got mostly social work students. We've got a school of medicine, speech language pathology, and some others. If you answered other, if you want to just drop in the chat what your discipline is, um, that'll be helpful. So without further ado, um, we will get into our uh, panel presentation for the day. So um, I'm gonna offer up these questions one at a time and then we'll have time at the end for uh, some Q&A from the audience. So, um, We'll start with this question. What is your name, your degree, your license, and where do you currently work? And we'll start with Liz. Hi, everybody. My name my name is Liz Cohen. Um, let's see. I got my master's of social work from Howard University in Washington, DC. I practiced in DC for um, maybe about 16, 18 months and then moved to um, West Virginia where I have to give credit where credit is due. Kevin Meehan is one of the first social workers that I met in the state who I talked to about work opportunities. So networking is key. Um, but uh, what I do now is, so I am licensed at an LICSW in West Virginia and Pennsylvania. And I work for the uh, WVU Medicine Department of OBGYN, where 30 years ago, uh, our, our chair at that time said, I just came from Vermont where we had integrated mental health services in our health clinics, and that's what I want to happen. And so I have a clinical mental health practice within the department of OBGYN in their outpatient outpatient services clinic. And that's what I, that's what I do now. Great. Thank you, Liz. Mm -hmm. uh, hand it over to Rhonda next. Hi, I'm Rhonda Scollard. I am a social worker at the Waynesburg Outpatient Clinic of WVU Medicine. I have my bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Pittsburgh in social work. I'm licensed in Pennsylvania as an LSW, licensed as an LGSW in West Virginia, and I'm studying to take my LCSW exam in Pennsylvania. All right, thank you, Rhonda. And Kevin. All right, uh, Kevin Meehan here. Um, I have a 
BSW from SUNY Brockport, which is in Western New York. I practiced up there for a couple of years and came to WVU to get my master's and was fortunate enough to be part of the NIMH uh, training program at that time. Um, I am licensed in Ohio, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. Um, and I worked at, um, I worked for UHA, uh, Department of Behavioral Medicine and Psychiatry, um, on a telemedicine uh, program. Wonderful. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I think it's it's nice to hear all of your different backgrounds and your licenses because there is a, a wide array of different license types um, available to social workers. So um, next question, what do your day-to-day -day duties look like? And uh, Liz, we'll start off with you again. Okay, I'm going to digress just for a second here. Just for those of you who aren't sure that you want to go into social work, my undergraduate degree was in theater studies. So you could do, you can get into social work with, with you know, if that's what you want to do, you can find a way to do it. Um, my day-to-day -day work has really changed or has evolved over the 30 years that I was there from obviously just starting a, a program to now um, we have a mental health team of three for our department. Um, clinically, I am seeing patients. Um, I work four days a week. Clinically, I am seeing patients three days a week. I have uh, where I am seeing patients, you know, on the hour and um, doing chart notes and um, getting referrals from our patients, uh, from our providers with issues like um, depression, anxiety, postpartum depression, eating disorders, a lot of grief and bereavement work. Um, substance abuse, um, some pregnancy specific things like coping with IVF treatment and diagnoses, um, and then some life kind of things, um, dealing with a partner's death, divorce, cancer, adjusting to parenting, those kinds of things. Um, and then I also have some teaching responsibilities. And so my, my last day is an ad admin day where I do um, where I do my prep work for um, a couple of grants that I work on and um, uh, the lectures that I do for medical students and residents. That's great. Thank you, Liz. So it sounds mm -hmm. like you've got a nice blend of clinical work and also some administrative work and like you said, I'm sure that's evolved over the years, but you really do get to kind of dig down into the issues that these patients are facing in many different yep. life domains. Yeah, yeah that's great. Thanks, Liz. All righty, Rhonda, we'll go next to you. I usually start my day just doing the housekeeping task of checking emails, things like that. There are five clinic social workers and referrals go into the social work pool for all of the clinics. So I always check that to see what referrals I have, you know, what, what, am, what am I needed for? What do they need me to do? It's been a little slow because having a social work and worker in this clinic is brand new. Um, it's been about four months now. They're getting much better. A lot of hesitancy from staff in giving me the things that fall under my job description, such as making referrals, doing the home care, um, things like that. They were a little possessive, but it's getting much better. Um, I've started doing a lot of prescription assistance programs for patients who are on very costly medications. Um, we have an OBGYN practice that comes to the clinic and I've gotten quite a few referrals in the last few weeks to help expectant moms set up transportation. Um, there was one girl that moved from West Virginia to Pennsylvania, and I'm in the process of trying to connect her with a peer support person. So it's a little bit of everything. Um, before I left today, I was with the dermatologist helping a patient 
call and schedule an appointment to be evaluated for a new melanoma. So it's just being there to support the physicians, support the patients and helping them to get what they need. A lot of it is home care and things like that. So I'm excited people are adjusting, learning what a social worker can do. And one of the reasons I want to get my LCSW, which I'm almost done with my hours, was exactly so that I can incorporate that into the clinic instead of sending people out all the time. Yeah, that's great, Rhonda. I think that's, that's a great example of just the, the variety that you have in outpatient work. And, you know, the different settings will present their own challenges, but it sounds like you have a lot of different disciplines that you interact with. Um, yes. We'll talk a bit more about here in a little bit. All righty. Uh, Kevin, let's hear from you. Sure. Um, so I work on a telepsychiatry consultation team. It started about uh, two years ago. I've been with the program for about a year. And um, what we do is we uh, get psychiatric referrals from various emergency departments who are participating in our program, including Fairmont uh, Medical Center, UHC, Braxton Medical Center, Summersville, uh, Wheeling Hospital. Um, and so basically uh, the team consists of a psychiatrist, a uh, uh, nurse practitioner and physician assistant. So if there's a need for medication recommendations, that part of the team handles it. Um, if they're just looking for a psychiatric referral and some assistance, in trying to identify um, uh, next steps for somebody in the emergency department, um, then I'm tapped to, to handle that one. So um, so as you can imagine, uh, it's pretty much all age groups, which is a challenge. Um, I think the youngest I've ever seen, patient ever seen was a seven year old and the oldest was probably 79. Um, and so there's, a lot of collateral contacts with family members, APS, CPS. Um, and the nice part about this job is that we are consultants. And so we make recommendations and it's up to the emergency department to take it from there, either take our recommendations or not. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, position to be in. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting, Kevin, and I appreciate that, and I appreciate the kind of diversity that we're already seeing in the different roles that you all are in. Um, you know, Liz may be seeing the same patient for many sessions over time, um, and Rhonda may have that, but Kevin, you're probably just kind of seeing the need and letting the person go on to their next service provider um, as soon as you're done with your consultation, so um, lots of different ways that social workers are part of the healthcare team. All righty. Um, so next question, I, I, I think we like to tell stories as social workers, and I think we do a good job of that. And so I wanted to hear some stories from you all um, and kind of just a brief story uh, demonstrating um, your favorite part of the job and then your least favorite part of the job so that we can kind of uh, get a sense of that. So we'll we'll switch our order this time. And um, you want to start with Kevin? Do you want to go ahead and get us started? Sure. Um, let's see. <clears throat> well, I already started getting into this consultation part, which is quite different than jobs I've had in the past. Um, but um, it's really always different. We never know what we're going to face when we come in in the morning. Um, right now, they have us on 12-hour shifts, which is a challenge. Uh, the last time I did that, I worked on a railroad, so it's been a long time ago. Um, so we come in and we get referrals on a pager. I just got one here a little bit ago, but I have a team member down in our, we call it the bullpen, where we huddle and we have our cubicles and our, our video setups and our access to the medical record system, which they call EPIC in the WVU medicine system. Um, 
and so I guess that variety is probably the favorite part of my job. Um, the least favorite is the crunch we have when we identify um, the needs of a patient, um, but we have a hard time matching that need with service providers, whether it's outpatient, particularly in child psychiatry, adolescent psychiatry, or if they need inpatient. Um, we've seen a, a bunch of closures recently of uh, inpatient units, including United Hospital Center. Um, Sharp has actually reduced their beds. Um, well, Ohio Valley Medical Center closed a couple years ago in Wheeling. Um, so there's there's been a, a bit of a, a crunch there uh, to try to get people into the appropriate service. So that, that's been challenging. The other part is sometimes we're busy and other times it's pretty quiet. So the downtime, I don't like the downtime so much. That should do it. Yeah, yeah, I, I can appreciate that as a person who um, really likes to be busy, you know, and, and you, you get a sense of um, accomplishment from that. So it's hard when it's yeah. downtime, but also probably good because that means there's fewer people that, that need your services, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Great. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Rhonda, how about we hear from you next? Pretty much like Kevin, I like the variety, whether it's in a hospital setting or the outpatient setting, you don't know what you're going to encounter. Um, and I like that. I don't like the standard, this is what you're doing at nine o'clock. This is what you're doing at 10 o'clock. <laughs> I like to keep busy. I like having things to do. What I don't like is when I have those people that you try to help and either they don't want the help, even though they've asked for it. And then when you come to them with, hey, this is what we can do. And they say, well, no, I don't want that. Or when you can't find the appropriate service in an area that they can access. And that's been my whole career. It's very hard when you know what to do, you're trying to do it, and then you're shut down. It's, it's just very sad. And I think like most people in this field, I like to keep busy. I don't like when I have downtime, I've been using that to study for my LCSW, um, spending a little more time on the PED side because I really have not had a lot of consistent PEDS experience. When I was in the hospital settings, I was in the ER or on a surgical oncology that only treated adults. So I'm starting to learn a lot more about PEDS and I do like that. So. Yeah, that, that's great, Rhonda. And I, I think that you bring up a, a really important part of the job, which is working with people that may not necessarily like what you do or may not really appreciate that you're there to help them. <laughs> um, and it's part of our role to build that therapeutic relationship. And in these healthcare settings, it's a really fast process, you don't have much time to develop rapport. You've got to really connect with those patients and then and move into the work that you do with them. So it takes a certain skill set, which is, is very needed in that setting. All righty, Liz, how about we hear from you next? Okay, well, I'm going to make it three for three. I think the best <laughs> and most favorite part of my job is the variety. And, and, you know, I think it, it takes a certain kind of person to be able to, um, to tolerate that because there is a lot of uncertainty that, you know, that that entails, but, um, but being able to provide clinical care, um, being able to teach, uh, being able to do some organizational wellness, um, mental health and wellness kind of programs, it, it really, um, 
it has really been an exciting um, kind of part of, of what they've allowed me to do. And, and I think that, you know, when you find an employer who is willing to let you, you know, have some ideas and try some things, and this is an interest. And, you know, I remember this is a lot of this pre-COVID, but um, we were doing childbirth classes and I kept feeling like nobody was talking to these parents with, with older kids, so siblings. So I said, you know, what if I taught a sibling class? Could we incorporate that into our childbirth class kind of a program? And so things like that, that, you know, if you have an interest and if you've got an employer who's who's willing to um, to hear what you have to do and, and, and you enjoy doing that work and enjoy keeping yourself sort of challenged, I think for me, that has been one of the, the most exciting things about my job is that it it has never gotten stale because there's always something different. And certainly clinically, you know, the patients are also different. Um, and I think, again, to echo a little bit of what, what um, Rhonda and Kevin have said, I think one of the hardest things is when resources for those folks are limited and, and you can't make the connections, you can't make the um, they uh, with the advent of telemedicine. And I, uh, and I will say that, um, uh, particularly with my OB population, you know, moms who are pregnant or who have, you know, little ones that they don't want to drag out to an appointment, you know, telemedicine has been a godsend. Um, but if they're calling, you know, as opposed to driving two and a half hours for a one hour appointment and then and back, but if they're calling from a really rural place, they may not have some of the same resources. You know, we are so fortunate in Morgantown and that we are resource rich. But but a lot of other communities in our state are not, and so that that is a really frustrating um, piece of you know just not having not having the um, the resources everywhere for the folks who need them. Yes, that is certainly a theme I can relate to in my time, both in community mental health and also in in the hospital setting. Just knowing the best thing for a client or a patient and then really kind of having to play a puzzle game. You know, I sometimes felt like a detective trying to track down, okay, what could work for this client or patient in their setting? And it's funny, it's interesting, the things that you find out that are out there that you didn't know exist, but there also is that reality that um, rural settings especially really don't have the resources that some of our patients need. So, yeah, I can appreciate that. Yeah. Um, all righty, next question. Uh, what other health professions do you interact with in your job and how do you interact with them? So we'll throw that to Rhonda first since she hasn't gone first yet. I interact with physicians, nurse practitioners, physician's assistants, LPNs, RNs, x-ray techs, the lab staff. Um, a lot of it is them coming to me and saying, I need help with this. Some of it is as simple as this little guy's really anxious. He has to get an x-ray. Can you come talk to him? You know, help calming down. So it's nice that they're seeing that I can do other things besides what they feel a social worker is to do. And a lot of times I take that opportunity to educate them because there are some providers that think all a social worker does is mental health or call CYS or drug and alcohol. And it's like, no, medical social workers do so much more. And I like having the opportunity to educate them and slowly by educating them, they're now reaching out with referrals for other things, so. Yeah, that's great, Rhonda. And I think, you know, that's one of the reasons we're having this session is so that we can kind of educate other health professions on the front end before they get into their uh, final, or, you know, after they graduate to really understand just how much social workers can help patients. Yeah. So that's great. Thanks, Rhonda. You're welcome. Uh, let's go to Kevin next. Sure. Um, so, so the 
other professionals that I interact with, uh, certainly the uh, first one is the emergency room doctors and advanced practice nurses um, and PAs. And um, I've come to appreciate what they do. I've never really worked in an emergency department before, but I'm getting a real good glimpse of that now. Um, they're under a whole lot of pressure um, and they deal with everything under the sun. Um, and so they do have to rely on specialty areas like ours uh, to help them kind of steer, get some uh, opinions, consultations on how to proceed with patients. Um, so that's kind of the rub too. Uh, they, they're they under so much pressure. Sometimes they'll try to push you into making a decision. And sometimes we're just not ready to, to pull the plug or to come up with an actual conclusion of what we're seeing in our screen um, and during the assessment. So uh, fortunately we have great resources to back us up here. Um, and so if they, uh, uh, they want to move on to talk to someone else. They certainly can, uh, but we're we're told, look, take your time, make sure you do a good job, you're thorough, um, and the rest is up to how the case goes in their hands. In other words, the emergency department's hands. Um, but you know, this is a, a definitely a medical host setting. Um, WVU Medicine has lots of leadership with MDs and RNs after their names. And so it's kind of become, for me anyway, second nature to work with different professions. We all have our strengths and our areas, you know, where we really are challenged. And so we try to complement each other the best way we can. Um, I don't know how many times I've, I've talked to our team members, our PAs or nurse practitioners and our consult team, you know, how does a mental hygiene process work? Or how do you make a CPS referral? It's like things you would take for granted, you know, normally in our field. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of give and take. And it's been, uh, that's been pretty nice to be part of. Yeah, that's, that's great, Kevin. And, um, you know, I think one of the things that I, I wanted participants to hear today was just how much interaction a social worker can have with other medical professionals. And I think that's important for folks that they really are passionate about helping people in a clinical setting like healthcare, but they're just not quite sure that they want to go into nursing or you know, PA or uh, med school. And I think it's good for them to know that you can still help patients in a healthcare setting um, with a social work role and a social work degree. So that's a great example of that, Kevin. I appreciate that. Um, all righty, let's hear from Liz. Okay, so I, I also work with physicians, uh, residents, um, our advanced practice professional nurses, our physician assistants, and our nurse practitioners. Um, and, and those are the folks who are referring to me and who I work very closely with in terms of if, um, if uh, I, I think, I, I feel pretty strongly that a patient needs a good medication evaluation and I'm going to ask them to go back to their provider. Um, if they're pregnant, they're probably going to go to their OB. If they are not a pregnant patient, then I'm going to recommend that they either go to their primary care physician or to behavioral medicine because those are the experts in terms of um, psychiatric medications. And so if, if there is a, um, any kind of uh, situation where I feel like a, an evaluation would be helpful for a patient, I'm going to recommend that. And I'm going to, you know, give a heads up to the, to the um, referring physician or, or the PCP to say, you know, this, this is, you know, I think we need to, we need to take a closer look at this patient. And so there's a lot of um, exchange and I, and I really, I, I think and it is all, all for the um, benefit of the patient. It all works really, really well for them. Um, the other folk, the other group of folks that I, professionals that I come into contact with is, you know, there are a lot of community referral services. Um, there are 
um, substance use programs out there that refer to, for our services. There's the Right from the Start community program. There's the Helping Appalachian Parents and Infants Initiative. Um, and so you will find wherever you find yourself in a community. And, um, and I think it's really important to avail yourself of, of what, those, what those services are. You know, know that in your community, that in Morgantown, we have RDVIC as a um, intimate partner violence resource, you know, to, to know what, what those groups are and to make sure that they know you and that, that you have some of that exchange. Because again, I think that that works towards the, towards the um, only benefits our patients. Yeah, that's that's a, a great point, Liz, that, you know, the contacts that medical social workers have don't end at the walls of the clinic. You know, they really mm -hmm. do extend out to the community. And, um, you know, I remember my time in um, psychiatric hospital social work that I was such a, a, a well-knowledged, well-networked person because I knew who my people were and I was going to call if I needed something. <laughs> and they knew that they could call me if they needed something. Yep. And, um, that's a big part of social work, I think, is is networking and getting to know each other. And, um, you know, the students here that are social work students now, you are going to be interacting with your fellow students out in the field in the professional world. You know, you're going to um, do referrals to each other and rely on each other for information and resources for your own patients, and your own clients. So networking can never be um, mm -hmm. underscored enough, in, in my opinion. All righty. Um, so you all have kind of started to talk about this a bit, but I wanted to maybe um, explore it a little bit more. Uh, so the question is, what do you wish other health professionals knew about social work, social workers, and or your role? So uh, who, who wants to start us off? <laughs> Kevin, you look like you're ready. Sure. <laughs> um, well, we all don't work for the Department of Welfare. Uh, right. But now it was DHS. <laughs> um, Thank God for that. It's a tough job and uh, underpaid, heavily utilized. So the diversity of social work, I think, is something that some people are really kind of amazed at. So, um, so the um, I think we have this focus on person and environment that uh, I think we all take pretty seriously dealing with all the psychosocial aspects and truly, um, you know, looking at the context where people are coming from, um, whether it's geographic in their community or culturally, um, ethnically, racially, you know, what is, what is their background? What is their culture talking to them? Um, and how do we involve that component in treatment and assessment? Um, so it's hard to, um, to really kind of broadcast that message other than just working side by side folks I found. So that's what I would like. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. I think, you know, that's such a, uh, an important part of the perspective that social workers have. And that's why we really say that you know, there's people that, that are in helping professions, but they don't have the social work perspective. And um, I think that training that we offer people in social work degrees is really unique because of its our systems thinking and our thinking of the person mm -hmm. in their environment. I can think of examples where, um, you know, we have a patient who just is not compliant with their diabetes uh, food routine and you know, the, the doctor's puzzled, the dietitian's puzzled, and, you know, a social worker can come in and talk to that patient and uncover the very puzzle that is leading that person to not be uh, compliant with their diet. Um, and so it's because we, we really see the person in their actual environment and what they are going through. Um, so it's a really, really good role, I think. Um, I'm obviously a little biased, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, person and environment offers up a lot uh, to to people in healthcare. 
So I appreciate that perspective. Rhonda, uh, what do you wish that uh, these health professionals knew about your role? I wish that I, they knew that, like Kevin said, we all do not work for CYS and that our training is so diverse and that we're not simply someone who can make a referral that because we take the time to meet with people, to figure out what's going on, have those conversations, like the diabetic who may be from a background that it's important to them culturally to eat a lot of carbohydrates or different things like that. Other professions don't always have the time or take that time. And I know myself, I always try to meet people where they are. And if it means an uncomfortable bit of time for me, that's okay. You just have to meet people at a level where you can communicate and you can start to build that trust. And I just wish other practitioners understood that we are capable of so, so much more. Yeah, thank you, Rhonda. I think that's well said. And um, just in case anybody's unclear, CYS, CPS, that, that's essentially the child welfare system that, that um, addresses child abuse and neglect, um, and also adult um, and disabled and elderly people's um, abuse and neglect. So in case anybody was confused about that, that's what we hope uh, health providers know. We're, we're more than that. <laughs> yeah. All right, Liz, let's hear what, what you would like. Um, a lot of a lot of the same. I, I think that I wish that um, folks understood the varied levels of, of practice uh, responsibilities and choice. That, that we have. And I think Ron, Rhonda has used my words. I think that, um, you know, our, our focus is meeting the patient where the patient is. And, and one of my recent soapboxes has been when physicians have, um, have written a referral for a mental health consult for a patient. And, and so they get a coveted new patient consult slot and they don't show. And, um, one of the things that I have really been harping our providers about is, you know, it doesn't, this is, this is a different kind of practice. It's not like a broken bone where it has to be set, where there's not a lot of choice. People have to agree. They have to want a mental health service. If you're, you know, it, it, just because you offer it doesn't mean that everybody wants it. And so um, that idea of um, moving a little bit away from that kind of medical view of how you take care of people into a more holistic kind of view that takes into account patients' desires and wishes. And, and as Rhonda said, you know, uh, sometimes being frustrated because someone sort of says, well, no, I don't want that. Well, I think that sometimes their, their providers who made the referrals don't even bother to ask or to check or to, or to get the patient's buy-in that this is in fact something that they want to do. So, so that to me is one of the things that I, that I wish, um, that I hope more, more than I wish that I hope that is something that, that we will see a shift in, in terms of, uh, the medical profession and, um, being more, um, more ready to um, to look at mental health um, choices that our patients have. Yeah, I see a lot of head nods from Rhonda and Kevin <laughs> on that. It's uh, it's definitely true, and I I I experienced that myself in my time in the hospital setting. They, you know, sometimes providers think like, oh, I don't have to talk to the patient about how they feel about the treatment that I'm recommending. That's the right. social worker's job. Um, and yeah, it, it, having a social worker in a clinic does not um, exclude healthcare providers from being the caring and interactive uh, providers that they usually are or can be. Um, so it, it is an interesting dichotomy of, you know, medical providers need to interact with their patients in a way that's affirming and supportive, but then they also need to know when and how to refer to a social worker. 
And I think this panel does help that um, to that end a lot. So we appreciate all of your all's input. Um, all right, so our last question before we open up for Q&A is what is a take home message that you wish uh, for people in the audience to remember after this event? And we'll start with uh, Liz. Um, okay, um, the first piece of practical advice I have is take your licensing exams as soon as you can. As soon as you are eligible to take them, take them as soon as you graduate <laughs> because you forget stuff. So that's my that's my practical piece of experience. Take those exams as soon as you can. Beyond that, reach for the stars. You know, there are possibilities out there. Your career will change over time and and just just imagine what the what the possibilities could be. Decide what you want to focus on and just go for it. And and do what you have to do to to make it happen, but there are places that everyone who wants to practice social work can fit and it's just finding the right fit so that's that's what i recommend but take those exams early <laughs> yeah, i can i can appreciate that advice and you're right i mean we're seeing social workers in L nfl teams now we're seeing them in corporate settings as well yeah, and everywhere well, everywhere I, I personally think everybody could use a social worker but again <laughs> i am biased <laughs> All right, thanks, Liz. Let's hear from Rhonda next. I agree with take your exams. I did not take my LSW till I was out of grad school for about five years. Uh, so yes, take it sooner rather than later. And I agree, keep reaching for the stars. If you want more education, get it. If you think that you want to specialize in a certain area, go for it. There is always something that you're going to find that you excel in. I have my case management certificate because I was very interested in how the case managers were interacting with not just the physicians, but the insurance companies and fighting on behalf of patients to get authorizations for the services they needed. So I have my ACM certification. I went back and got a certificate in healthcare compliance because I felt that was important that when you document your documentation needs to be correct. It needs to be something that if that record's pulled you can walk into a court of law and they're not going to question your ability. Those are areas that are close to my heart. And I think we all have those. You just need to find them. And once you find them, strive to get everything you can to make you the best in that area. Yeah, thanks, Rhonda. I appreciate that that call. And, you know, I, I encourage students to think of their MSW or BSW degree as, as a launching pad, mm -hmm. because you, we could never teach you everything that you ever could need to know in your whole career in a two-year or four-year program. What you do learn is how to know what you need to know <laughs> and how to go and find it. Mm -hmm. And that's a great example of what you've done, Rhonda. You've specialized and, and you've seen the need, the area of need in your own education and knowledge and uh, continue to pursue it. And that's, that's a great message. All righty, Kevin, what, what is your take home message for our folks here? Well, you know, um, I'm kind of biased in the mental health field, but, you know, um, I think that there's been studies looking at um, who are the professional groups that provide mental health care? Well, Overwhelmingly, it's MSWs, uh, 60 to 70 percent in the behavioral health field. Uh, the care is provided by uh, clinical social workers. Um, but, you know, I see people come and go out of the field. And, my God, we have so much breath to our profession with aging, occupational social work or EAP. Uh, I did a little bit of that uh, social uh, child welfare 
um, housing and working with the homeless population, uh, substance use disorders, uh, social action and policy research. I mean, it's you can re-gear um, as you go along in your profession. You know, you might do something for a while, take a break, come back, do something else. Uh, I think it's tremendously um, um, broad in its scope and uh, provides a great uh, avenue for folks in whatever interest they're in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very well said, Kevin. And yeah, I think that that's one of the probably surprising things that um, I hear from a lot of students who learn about social work is that we we teach the micro or individual level, the meso or group level, and the macro or organization and community and society level yeah. of practice. Um, and so it, it's great to have that that setting to then go and make a, a change or a difference. Um, in many different ways in, in our society. So I think that's a great message for sure. All righty, so we've gotten through all of our prepared questions and now uh, I'd like to open it up to um, the participant group. Um, looks like we've got one question already in the chat. So feel free to drop things in the chat. That's probably the easiest way to manage the questions. So we have uh, when social workers in medical settings need interpretation services for non-English speaking patients, do you have access to the same system doctors use or how does that work? Yeah, yeah we do. Yeah, we do. And, and maybe that's the um, beauty of working within a big medical, you know, a, a big established medical setting. But yes, we all use one system and... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. that's a good, a good point. It definitely will depend on the agency or clinic or, or mm -hmm. company that you work in. But essentially, if that company contracts out for non-English speaking certain interpretation services, then social workers can access that. Other questions? I have a question. Go ahead. Um, this is for Kevin specifically, and I don't know if this is too broad of a question, but how did you like get to where you are now? Like, what did you do to get oh, to where God. you are now? Because I really like your job, so I really I want to know like <laughs> there. Wow. Um, let's see. Uh, I mean. I worked in a variety of settings. I got my BSW, as I mentioned, and worked for Catholic charities in the rural part of central New York state and had a real broad perspective there. Um, some child welfare, some work with adults, did adoption studies. Then the MSW program, um, uh, it was fantastic. It was uh, a long time ago. Um, we won't say when, um, but, uh, so the NIMH training grant was really good. We had a field placement that was uh, uh, at a rural clinic. I, I did my placement at um, Clay Battelle Health Center out in Blacksville. Um, there was mental health positions out there. And so that was really um, great because that was an integrative care model, even back then, mm -hmm. where we had family practitioners, we had dentists, we had health educators, nurses um, who would refer various patients to us because they saw in a family practice setting that, you know, 70, 80% of the issues they were dealing with had a psychosocial component. Um, and so, you know, it was a great avenue for referral. Um, but after grad school, did a little research and planning stuff, uh, served on the board of NASW, got to put out a shout for them too. It's an important organization to keep maintained. Um, but I, um, I could, back in the mental health field, I opened up with a group of other folks, Chestnut Ridge Hospital um, in the late 80s. And then after six or seven years doing that, left and went in the private uh, sector doing um, behavioral health managed care um, and employee assistance program management. Um, 
So I always kind of had my hand with uh, clinical supervision, consultation, um, and then got got back into this role later on. So, I mean, it's been quite a ride. Uh, about ready to hang up the shingle, <laughs> and, uh, get out of the field, but uh, it's been good. Thank you for sharing that with me. I just really mm -hmm. like your job now, so <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> looking forward to something. So thank you. Well, I think it's a growth area. I think it really is an area of growth. Um, you know, we're starting with these some hospitals now, but um, I think it's a model that's going to really take off and continue to grow. So hopefully there'll be jobs when you get out of school. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Kevin. And thanks, Elise, for that question. Um, we have a question in the chat. Um, as someone who is currently a sophomore, what are the education requirements to work in a healthcare setting as a social worker and possibly into the mental health field? So I can answer, give a basic answer to that as a social work educator. Um, so essentially the education requirements are the same for the most part. So I say for the most part because um, if you get a BSW degree, that's a degree that qualifies you for a number of jobs across many different settings. Um, the only difference is you may need a master's degree to do some specific work in the mental health field. So you can do work in the mental health field with a bachelor's degree, but it won't be that clinical work or that therapy work that's as intensive as the master's degree. Um, so essentially the good news is you can get your BSW and MSW and you have this whole menu or buffet of options for you. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to add anything else to that answer or fill in any gap I might've missed. I know in acute care settings, they typically want a master's degree, but I also know that one of the big health systems in Pittsburgh is hiring BSWs as discharge planners. So they're not called a social worker, but they will hire you in one of the large hospitals. So mm -hmm. that is something um, dialysis clinics typically one a master's, I was required to have a master's and a license for my current role. So. And one of the things to keep in mind is that um, a, a hospital unit, a, a, a health center, you know, one of their um, one of their bottom lines is their financial health. And so if you are able to bring in revenue, that makes you more you know, uh, that makes you look much more favorable to them. And so getting licensed at the highest level that you can, um, so that if you are able to um, to bring in some revenue, that, that also makes a difference, I think, in terms of employability. Yeah, that's a great point, Liz. I saw Jamie pop out, pop into a video for a second. Jamie's yeah, one of the so, instructors. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I know, you know, I worked it within the UPMC system um, for many years, and you were required to have a master's and a license in most hospital based roles. And that is due to the re, uh, reimbursement from insurance um, that is looking up. But there are different levels. But again, as you had kind of stressed, Megan, it probably is not at the highest clinical level. So if that's really what you're looking at, it's um, it is an advanced degree. Um, and, and there's also some programs out there that have specializations in medical social work, too. We don't have that at WVU, but if that's also an area that students are interested in, it might be something that they look at even for graduate work or to see what opportunities are available for them even in, you know, postmasters and doctoral roles, if there's any specializations out there. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. I appreciate that. Um, all righty, we have a question, another question. If one were to be interested in working in the children's hospital here as a medical social worker, would that be possible or would you just be put where you were needed within a place like Ruby? I yeah, I think it's going to be. 
it's going to be the same kind of thing, you know, masters and uh, background checks and uh, licensing be real important. I mean, there's some specific job uh, uh, postings for children's, mm-hmm. um, but uh, I mean, it's all, you know, you can kind of pick and choose an area in the hospital or department. And children does post separately for social workers. So it's not like you apply, interview, and are just put where you're needed. You would apply specifically for Ruby, or you could apply specifically for Wheeling, or apply specifically for the Children's Hospital. So that is definitely an option. Yeah, thank you. Um, got another question. I think there's two questions here. So we'll start with one and then go to the other one. So are there opportunities to do interdisciplinary presentations with medical staff to encourage and apply NASW ethics and values and trauma-informed care in medical contexts? So, so yes, I mean, the quick answer to that is, for instance, in our department, we do grand rounds every week. And so there are presentations on everything and I have done them. And um, this morning, our, um, our um, sexual therapist did a presentation on what she does. And so, you, yes, there are lots of opportunity, I think, within a medical setting. Mm-hmm. What do you guys mm-hmm. think? Oh yeah, definitely. We have grand rounds too in psychiatry, and yeah, and they're and the the topics are quite varied. So I'm, yeah. I've been really impressed with that. Just have to connect with the right person and let them know what your interests are. Yeah, yep, that makes a lot of sense. Um, the next. Part of the question is, do medical professionals take social workers seriously slash would they take the time to attend this type of training? And then I'm not sure if this is part of that question or another question, but it says, do you case conference together or just in your own quote unquote team? Well, uh, I can try uh, at least part of that. I mean, we do case conferencing in a small group setting with um, we join sometimes with a larger consult team that covers Ruby and our telepsych team. Um, and so we do share a lot of information um, between the different groups. Um, and, uh, you know, I would say that by and large, people are pretty informed about the issues uh, that we're dealing with. And I think the other part of that is I was going to say one more thing about, Mm -hmm. you know, when social workers come out into the field, make sure you can find a good supervisor. And when you apply for a job, ask, is there supervision included? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because not everywhere provides supervision. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, that's a good point. Supervision, good supervision is, is really important. Megan, can I ask a question of the panel? Sure. So I first, I want to thank you all for sharing all of your years of experience. But as we talk with social workers, you know, one of the things that always comes up is about self-care and caring ourselves to be able to do this work for years. And I think sometimes when I'm working with students, they think self-care is really big. And I try to explain to them that it's not always super big things that we're doing. So when you think about self-care in each of your roles, um, how do you manage that for yourself or how does your team support you in having your own self-care? I'll start. I think you're right. A lot of people think self-care is you have to take a week off and go to a spa. No, self-care can be as simple as just taking a few minutes, going for a walk, sitting with someone you trust and say this just happened and it was a bit overwhelming can I just sit and share with you a little bit 
I wish self-care really could be a lot of what people think it is. It's just truly taking care of yourself. It can be that simple ride home from work, listening to your favorite music, or sometimes just riding home in silence. It doesn't have to be expensive, lengthy, complicated. It's just giving yourself what you need. And truthfully, over the years, I think what I've done the most is just take that few minutes if I need to walk away. There have been times you just have to walk off the unit or walk out of the clinic, get a breath, breath of fresh air, come back, and you're ready to go again. And I think it's important to remember that you can do this. It's like any other job you get into, get from it what you put into it. And I love my career. I wouldn't want to do anything else. But yes, there are days I think, what was I thinking? But that's everyone and everywhere. But overall, it is very satisfying to know that you've made a difference, mm -hmm. even if it's just a small difference. Yeah, and I think just to, to add on to that, I, I think that for me, what I have always tried to do with self-care is to not make it something extra that I do, but to make it a routine, a part of, of what my day is. For me, that means I walk to work and I walk home from work. And those 15 minutes in the morning get me sort of get my brain going and get me ready for it. And that decompression time on the way home, but it's not something that I've added. It's just part of part of the routine. And in, in the same way, I have also made a conscious decision not to put my work email on my phone because I, I am not in a, and I'm not in an emergency. Now there's some people who don't have that luxury and I get that but I'm not an emergency person. I'm not an on-call person. And so I, I have shaped my, my boundaries. And I think that that's part of it too. I didn't do anything extra. I just made sure that I knew where my limits were and that when my day is over, and sometimes it's over very late, but, but when it is over, my phone is my phone and I'm not, I'm not doing work stuff after hours. And, and, and so it's those kinds of things. So it's not, it's not looking at wellness or, or um, um, mindfulness as something that you add to your life. It's something that is part of your life for, for me. Yeah, I would agree with that. That's real important um, to maintain your, your own uh, wellness practice. And uh, it's different with everybody, um, how they do that, how they decompress after a long day. Um, in debrief and difficult situations. Um, leaving work, I like what uh, Rhonda said, just picking up and leaving and taking a walk. And fortunately, you know, we have a big campus here, so we can just go walk around the stadium or something and come back, um, especially when things are slow. Um, so just trying to do simple things. And, you know, um, as young social workers, there's a process of uh, how do you leave work at work? How do you maintain those boundaries? And that's that's really an evolution. Yeah, this is such an important topic. Thank you, Jamie, for bringing this up. And I'm kind of picturing a whole panel just on this topic alone. Mm -hmm. um, certainly helpful to hear what that looks like uh, wow. with social workers in particular. Um, all right, so we're a little, little past time. Um, and so I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, I did want to share my screen with the contact information. If you do want, if you're not already in a social work program, but you want to be, um, these are the people that you would contact. Um, the BSW program is Becca Dunaway, MSW program is Jackie Inglehart, and the PhD program is Carrie Brischel. So um, I just want to echo everyone's support and appreciation for Liz, Rhonda, and Kevin. Um, the work that you do is incredibly important and uh, you sharing your knowledge and experience here with us today was really invaluable. 
Um, so I feel really, really, really grateful to have you all here and to have heard from you today. Um, so with that being said, uh, if there's nothing else, then we'll go ahead and end our session. Thank all you right. for Happy asking social us. Work month. Thank you. Social work month. <laughs> Good to see you, Liz. Nice to meet you, Rhonda. Nice meeting you. You too, Rhonda. <laughs>